Let us pray. And now, O oh God, may it be less of me and more of thee. Hide me now behind the cross. Let me be a vessel of your will and your word. May some word be said and heard in these moments that will help us learn how to live together as your people. Amen. The Church of the Anomaly. This week, one of the members said something to me, uh, one of the church members said something to me that profoundly moved and challenged me and caused me to use a uh, maybe not so ordinary word in the sermon title. Anomaly means something like something unexpected. To be an anomaly is to be different uh, in a way that is in an unexpected way. For example, you may be born into a family where everyone has red hair and green eyes, but you're the only one with black hair and purple eyes. You are an anomaly. Or you may be someone who was brought up as I was in the projects and ghettos of the United States, where the statistics said that you were supposed to get pregnant at an early age, 14, 16, not finish high school, go on welfare, break the law, and live out this pattern from generation to generation. But you are an anomaly when you graduate from Yale and later with a PhD and become a preacher in Brooklyn Heights in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> you get the meaning of anomaly? <laughs> God calls the church, and all of God's people to be an anomaly. If we look at the scripture reading that was read in our hearing so beautifully this morning, we find Jesus, a Jewish rabbi, teaching us great wisdom about the mind and the heart of God. Normally, in our world, we are inclined to trust power and to trust might. Jesus tells us in scripture, though, and it's clearly here, translated from the Aramaic, there is no way around it. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and wealth. Does this mean that people who are wealthy are useless in our world and our society? Does it mean that they are not close to God when they have a lot of material resources? I would say no, this is not, that would be a simplistic interpretation of what Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, is talking about in this scripture. Rather, I would say if the wealth was used to help others, then it is good to be wealthy. I went to a gathering this week uh, with another church member where some either 1,400 or 1,600 nonprofit after-school tutoring programs were giving awards for people who had helped poor children, children who we would call marginalized or at risk, to have a better chance to get an education. 
For many of our law enforcement officers, our legal people, our judges know that our prisons are built according to how many children will not make it by the third grade. Our educational level is closely tied in to how many will make it in the society as law-abiding citizens, able to work jobs, raise families, and support themselves. This organization was put together by people who had resources. And yet they use that money, that wealth, in a godly way, in a way to help children who they did not want to grow up to become a part of the jail or prison population. It was an anomaly to sit there in that beautiful space for that, that banquet, that fundraising banquet, with its beautiful white tablecloths and floral arrangements that were gorgeous beyond belief, and to eat prime rib that melted in my mouth like butter. It was wealth. And yet it was an anomaly for the money was being gathered for the sake of the poorest of the poor. Jesus has a disturbing way of saying to be an anomaly is to be someone who doesn't follow the crowd. In God's sight, right and wrong is defined by how much we depart from mob mentality. Certainly, as we saw that beautiful reading that Tanya did from Elizabeth Eckford, it is a challenge to all of us today if we would seek to be different, to diverge from the group, the herd instinct that often brings us into trouble and blocks us from understanding the mind and the will of God. On that day, Elizabeth Eckford, as Tanya read, did not get the message to go with the other eight young people to Central High School in Little Rock. And so she walked alone at a very young age in the midst of a mob who yelled out, lynch her. And the ones who were, we paid our taxes for to protect her, chose not to be an anomaly in that day in the South. They chose to follow the crowd, the popular opinion. And so those whose job it was to protect did not protect. Those whose job it was, uh, was given to them by the president of these United States to go into that situation as enforcement to make sure that every citizen had the rights of citizenship in this great and glorious democratic country. They did not understand that God's will exists, often in difference, not when everybody's opinion is the same. The church is called to be an anomaly. The people of God are called to not trust in things that you think we might ordinarily trust in. Rather, Jesus calls us in the scripture from the Sermon on the Mount to know that our safety rests in following the will and the heart of God. And ultimately, that is all that we have. That is what will protect us from the cradle to the grave 
if we walk not trusting in things that look powerful, not trusting in things where everybody might say this thing is the right way, but rather Jesus says, seek first God and God's kingdom, and then you don't have to worry about the rest. He said, if you follow God, even when you, in the hours when you are by yourself, and nobody understands righteousness in the way that you do, even when the group and the crowd says it must be one way. Jesus says, if you follow the mind of God that is planted deep within the heart of each and every one of us, therein lies our safety and our protection. When I was a child in those projects, Cabrini Green in Chicago, 84th Precinct, the people in that community and me, because I watched the others, we were afraid of uniforms. You look so beautiful and so magnificent to me now as an adult in those uniforms with those white gloves. You are marvelously beautiful. Yet when I was a child to see a uniform, we were not taught as little children about officer friendly. To see a uniform in my poor and depressed neighborhood was to run in the other direction. When the Cabrini Green housing projects were a city unto themselves, the buildings were higher than 20 stories. And I remember that some of the teenagers and young adults, if they saw a policeman would drop a car tire down from 20 stories trying to target that policeman. And yet, I remember when my first year in undergraduate school as a freshman or fresh woman, I was with a group of other young people. I was 17 and a half. And many of us had never been away from home that much. And when we went into that college town, Many of us were poor and deprived, which was no excuse. I went in with a group of girls who, unbeknownst to me, went in the store in that town and shoplifted clothing. They did this on a regular basis because even though they had gotten grants and scholarships to go to school, they did not have the clothing that the rest of the students at the university had. So me, not knowing up from down, hung out with this group, as young people are often inclined to do, and went in the store looking at all the beautiful things, as I tend to do, because I am very visual. Unbeknownst to me, while I was walking around looking at all the costume jewelry and dresses and things that young people are impressed by, my friends were putting clothing and costume jewelry and whatever they could find in their purses and under their coats and sweaters. This went on for a long time. The store owner was gracious. Week after week, I think, my friends went in and robbed that store blind. Finally, one day, the poor store owner probably decided enough. So as we were in the store and I was doing my usual roaming around, looking at things, oblivious to what was going on around me, the police burst in through the door and arrested every single one of us. I remember being put in a jail cell, some place I had never been before. And I remember being afraid to use the bathroom because it was dirty. 
And I remember a correctional officer bringing me a cheese sandwich, which I refused and disdained to eat because he had it in his hand. That same day, somebody arranged for us to go before the judge. That judge was well up in age. And I will never forget it as long as I live. He looked me straight in the eyes and he said, young lady, what are you doing here? You do not belong here. I want you to go back and go to school and study and do the things you have come to this university to do. I am going to let you go and I never want to see you here again. That anomaly, that judge who saw me as a human being, rather than as a 17 and a half year old African American juvenile delinquent, set me free. God calls us as the church and as the people of God to diverge from popular opinion. Whenever you are among the crowd and everybody agrees with whatever decision you are trying to come to, remember that Jesus said that the kingdom of God has nothing to do with trusting in the ordinary. Rather, we must trust in God. And oftentimes, the voice of God is a voice of difference in our world. A lonely voice crying out in the wilderness. That voice will protect us and see us through. Elizabeth Eckford, in closing, said, she looked into the face of a woman, and that face looked kind. But the woman chose to follow the crowd. And the child was mistaken and was still left alone in the midst of that dangerous situation. And yet one man had the courage, a white man, had the courage to sit down beside her. For he knew that he could not serve power and common ordinary opinion. If her life was to be saved and this great country was to live up to its greatness. You are entrusted 84th Precinct with all of our lives and our safety and our welfare. We look to you to protect us. Will you see us for who God created us to be? Will you make the difference in our lives so that we might be set free to be all of who God has created us to be? Elizabeth Eckford could have gone down in history as the little girl who died for justice. Rather, she went down in history with the man who sat beside her, as people who stood up in difference from the pressure to give in to what everybody else thought. And now she is written down in history as one of the Little Rock Nine. And this country and our world is so much better for it. The church member who talked about anomaly said that now when we walk in these official and government buildings, there are different faces and pictures on our wall. We see the face of an African-American president, Barack Obama. We see the face of an African-American attorney general, 
Eric Holder. What difference will it make? Will they choose in their power and their influence, which is wealth, to protect us all in this country, in our society? Or will they choose in their positions of official, legislated, given power influence to just maintain the status quo and to keep things the way that they are. I declare now to all of us, if we choose to, to support that which is unexpected, if we choose to support that which diverges from the ordinary, Nothing and nobody can stop us. For God dwells in the spirit of that which is different from the mob mentality of the herd and the crowd. And I know that if we follow God, as Jesus said, if we seek God first, that is wealth. That is wealth beyond all belief and all imagining. I have walked now with God a mighty long time. And God has not left me yet. We are so grateful to you, 84th Precinct for walking out in these dangerous streets and all of your youth, all of your strength, and all of your beauty to protect us. I pray that you will choose to walk with God, that you will trust God above all other things to help you make the important decisions about people's lives and welfare that you must make. And I hope that you do this for your own sakes, for God has promised that God will take care of you. You are not to worry. You are not to be afraid. Each day as you get up and put on a uniform that means something in our society and in our world. As you clothe yourselves in those uniforms, clothe yourselves in the spirit of God. And everything will be all right. Elizabeth Eckford walked in the spirit of God. And history shows that she is now a wife and a mother with two children, well, probably grown people by now. And she has lived a long and productive life because someone heard God's call to do it differently, to not go along with everybody else in fear, but to speak up and to stand up for what is right and in that, that is our security and our safety. God bless you for all that you do. We are grateful. We are thankful. And I pray that God will continue to keep you as you do the work that God has called you to do for all of our behalves in our world, in our community, in this Brooklyn Heights. Thank you. Amen. Let us pray. And now, O oh God, may it be less of me and more of thee. Hide me now behind the cross.